Hello again and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. It's 11 o'clock here in the East, 8 o'clock West Coast time. I'm your host and all-around snappy dresser, meteorologist DT from weatherrisk.com. And we're about to resume our uh, broadcast once again on a regular basis of This Week in Weather, except this time around, folks, I'll be doing it on a Wednesday. Wednesday afternoons or evenings are a lot better time for me, a lot less workload. Sundays were just too busy and too hectic for me, and it caused me to stay up way too late into the evening and through the entire week off. And also, I had to take a break during the uh, spring months because some of my grain clients were not comfortable with the idea of me doing all this weather analysis for free. And uh, so that was kind of an issue as well. So uh, lots to talk about here. There's definitely a very active pattern coming up here. So let's get right to it and see what we can uh, learn. We're not going to be talking about here hype. We're not going to be talking about hysteria or conspiracy theories, just good old science and using the brain. And in this, uh, this week, in this edition of This Week in Weather, we'll be talking about several different topics. One, why this summer has turned out to be so cool in the east and wet and dry and cool over the upper Midwest and the upper Mississippi Valley. We'll be talking about the MJO and the hurricane season and the superactive phase. And then also the, the tropical disturbances, 92L, that's the one in the Gulf of Mexico, or headed for the Gulf of Mexico, and 93L, which is now tropical depression number five. Um, which is off by the Cape Verde Islands off the southwest coast of Africa, and taking a look at what September 2013 might be like. Now, this image here shows us what the rainfall pattern has been since for June and July. We can see how wet it has been on the east coast from Ohio, pretty much from the Appalachians all the way to the east coast. You know, those blues in there, they represent, you know, uh, 200, 300, 400 percent above normal. But if we look at uh, the... Um, if we look at uh, in, in the Midwest here, we see, look at how dry it's been up in this whole area. So it's been a very, uh, in, you know, very um, wet and um, in, in on the East Coast, except in this area, and very dry in there. And there's a specific reason why that pattern has been going on. And we can, we'll figure that out in a second. This is the MJO pattern. Now, the MJO, as you, as you can see, as I say, has been in the circle of death here since, or the neutral zone, since July 9th. And for those that don't know, uh, the circle of death is this feature right up in here. This is when the MJO is neutral and it's not having any impact. So as you can see, it moved in here around July 9th or 10th, and it's been stuck and spinning its heels in here since then. So that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, why uh, I, we haven't seen a lot of change in the pattern. Now, this is the MJO now since uh, July 5th. To, to August 13th. Now we can see again, if we look in here, that the MGO is still stuck in the neutral zone. It's been on here the whole time. This is July uh, 5th, and then it moved in here mid-July. It's been stuck there the whole time. So until this feature comes out and goes away, it's not going to we're not seeing any impact from the MJO. That means something else is driving the pattern. So the MJO, the Maddie and Julian oscillation, is not having any impact. What's causing the pattern to change? Well, What's driving the pattern this summer is the sea surface temperatures. Now, this represents, this is at the end of July, but we can see in here these huge areas of super warm waters in the northern Pacific. You see the black arrows I've drawn in there? These represent water temperatures almost 4 degrees Celsius, which is 7 degrees Fahrenheit, above normal throughout the entire northern Pacific, and also in the northwest Atlantic as well. And if we compare that to what we saw last year, this is the sea surface temperature map from last year. Now, look what's going on. Totally different pattern. You see, this is last year when we had the heat wave and the drought in the Midwest and so on and so forth. But the image before that, this is July 2013. This is the current one. Totally different sea surface temperature map. And these two features are driving the pattern. Now, this represents, this is strongly connected to something known as the PDO. And if we can see, let me call this up in here. Now, here in the, in the warm phase of the PDO, notice that the warm waters are all up in this area. See, right along the coast, up, right up in here. And the cold waters are in here. And the cold phase, this, the cold water is right here, and the warm water is in here. Okay? So that's what the, uh, that's what the data shows And uh, when you have those particular phases, the warm phase and the cold phase. Now, if we compare that to what we've just been seeing here, we can clearly see that in July 2012, this was the warm phase in here. This was known as a positive uh, PDO in here. This was, excuse me, the negative PDO. God, I'm so tired. PDO in here. And this here's the positive PDO right here. So, now how does that affect things? Well, that helps determine and drive the pattern. So, uh, we can clearly see that 
by uh, going to our next slide here. Now, these are this, this is the current sea surface temperature maps uh, going into August. And again, we can see that super warm water in the northeast Pacific Ocean driving the pattern, setting up the positive P, uh, PDO, and that in turn is setting up the positive PNA. And this is how it works. When you've got a positive PDO here, the ridge is coming in. You see how the ridge is coming over the west coast of Canada? And then it drops down into the Midwest, and we get our cold air over the, or the central and eastern United States. And during the winter months, that, that's actually a stormy pattern. During the summer months, that represents a wet and cool Midwest and eastern United States. That's the current pattern. Last year, this is the image here on the right. This was uh, 2000 right here. Well, let me, this is 2012. Notice that we have the trough here and the ridges here and it's nice and hot in here. Now that's what we saw last year. We're not seeing that now, so it's a different pattern. And we can see how, that, how the sea surface temperatures are affecting the jet stream. There's our trough over the Midwest. You can clearly see it. And there's the warm water in the Northeast Pacific, and that's driving the pattern. This is as of August 6th. As long as that super warm water is still in the Northeast Pacific Ocean, the pattern will remain locked in place, and we'll continue to see below normal temperatures over the central and eastern portions of the U.S. Now, obviously, this is having some impact because in this sort of pattern, when, this, when the jet's coming down like this, this is all drying here. You're not getting any moisture. All your moisture is along this side of the trough. And we can see that in the next slide. There's our drought. And where is the, where is the rainfall? Here's our drought in here because the jet stream is coming down this way, right? So this is all drying here. You're not getting your rain. Meanwhile, it's, you're getting storms here, and you're getting cold fronts, and you're doing fine on the east of the Mississippi River. And we can see that in the next slide. This is the soil moisture map for July. Notice east of the Mississippi River, we've got pretty wet ground conditions. West, or over the Rockies, the Plain States, it's getting pretty dry, and it has been very dry. And that's now spreading to the west coast. This is the long, this is the short-term trend since July. And again, we can see the eastern United States is very wet. The plains are beginning to dry out as well, and the dry conditions continue into the Rockies. And this is this is how the jet stream reflects that. Now, notice, let me I'll get my marker here. We've have here's our jet coming down this way, right? See that? Okay. And what's over here? This is where the drought is. We'll go back. We'll take a look at the drought for a second. There it is. See that? Pretty cool, huh? Amazing how science works. And here's our trough in the eastern United States. That's today's jet stream map, by the way. Now, the Euro European model, the models have been showing this trough, massive trough coming for quite some time. This is the European model from August 4th, valid for today, for actually Monday, August 12th. And it showed the big trough coming in. And so the models have been showing this for quite a while. Now let's talk about the MJO and the Atlantic hurricanes. So you may not be aware of this new data which has come out here, but there's some indication that the MJO might be getting active. These are some of the uh, MJO models showing them moving into phase 8 and phase 1 as they go to late into August. If you don't know this, this is important information, so let me point this out to you here. This is the MJO. And it shows that during certain phases, we get a lot more activity. You get more major hurricanes, more hurricane days, overall activity, the number of named storms in phase one and phase two. Phase six and seven, you have more reduced activity. See that? Here, negative. Here, it's strong. So, we, so for active hurricanes, MGO should be in phase one and phase two. Okay? All right. We got that straight. And we can see how that works out. When during phase one and phase two, again, look, we can see here lots of activity here. See that? All this activity in here, very little. Okay? So this, again, is this is when activity is down, and here this is when activity is enhanced, plus. Okay? Good. Then um, we can even see this from major hurricanes, same sort of thing. Again, look, in phase one, Two active hurricanes, six and seven below normal hurricanes. Okay. Um, now this guy uh, Kyle McRitchie, he's a, a getting his uh, graduate degree at the University of Albany, and he produced a very some new new data. This is the website if you get a chance, take a look at it. And his showing the MJO here and 30-day forecast. He does the MJO to 30 days, and look what he's doing. He's showing the MJO. And this is very important, gets into phase one and phase two by the time we reach early and mid September. This is very, very significant because if this is right, as we showed, phase two and phase one are enhanced hurricane activity cycles for the MJO. So that's why this is important. 
Now, if the MJO does strongly move into Phase 8 and then Phase 1 in early September and Phase 2 by September 12th, this will greatly enhance the chances of seeing a colder than normal September, an early Midwest frost, and a very active part of the hurricane season during the middle of the first half of September, maybe even in all September. And we can see that. This is the current jet stream map. And we look at the ridge on the west coast. There's our trough. There's our jet stream bringing the cool air in. This is what we've been seeing all summer long. There's a jet coming down that way. And if we go up by day 10, though, that changes because this is the European ensemble. What happens is that when the west coast ridge disappears, the vortex moves up to northern Canada, and we now have the no, there's no ridge on the west coast. So we have a much warmer pattern. Not really a hot pattern by uh, August standards, but a warm pattern nonetheless. We can see the dust cloud in the uh, Western Atlantic from several days ago has disappeared completely. And in fact, we can see the warm waters here over the um, Atlantic developing nicely. And actually, if you want to point out here, the warm waters actually start increasing right here a little bit and also in the Gulf of Mexico. Actually, it started cooling down here a little bit, so that's also interesting. Now, this is the uh, disturbance from earlier today. This is a 92L. We saw it start, start developing here at midday. You can see, really see it explode this afternoon as it approaches the Yucatan. And this is the last picture I saw. This was taken uh, midday as well. Also, very impressive visible picture there. Now, these are the models that came out of 12Z. And you can see what's happened here is that all the models uh, I began to shift, show it, the, uh, it turning north. Why is it doing that? Because this is where the trough is. So the trough is here. So what happens is the hurricanes turn it and models pick it up and pull it into the Gulf and then into the southeast and U.S. And here, the hurricane model is now bending it to the west with 93L, which is now tropical depression number five. So that's, again, unexpected. There's the system developing very nicely this afternoon. And we can see on the uh, European model, this is day seven, the European model has the system out here. And it's a huge ridge to the north, but then it breaks it down and loses it. And it just, there's a, it just loses completely by day seven. There's no hints at all. It's just a, a big trough in the middle Atlantic. This is not correct. This is the wrong solution. The Europeans are wrong here because the Europeans are not seeing it. But that's neither here nor there. The system in the Gulf of Mexico is going to bring a lot of rain here uh, next week for the southeast United States. And given the rain they've had, it's probably going to produce flooding conditions for many areas up and down the southeastern U.S., from North Carolina down to Bama and Georgia. This is the European model day five. You can see the system uh, right here. Um, Okay, so there's the system at day five. And then the uh, FIM 9 model, the new, new and improved, um, it shows it very nicely here. This is also, as you can see, it's bending to the west by, uh, by the, uh, that's next week, day six as well. As we look at the day seven European pattern map here, we can see the warm pattern developing. The jet stream shifts to the north. Uh, and it looks pretty warm going into day 10. But the problem is if you look at the European ensembles, they actually... Um, have more of a trough coming in this way. So they're a little cooler than the actual operationally European. However, as you go further into September and October, the CFS continues to show very cold conditions here for week three and week four. Well, not very, very cool conditions for the Midwest, week three and week four. And if the MGO does move out into phase one and uh, two, that's actually going to verify. And if we look at the September forecast, we even see that the trend on the CFS here showing much colder than normal temperatures over the central and eastern United States. So that's our program. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We'll see what happens with these hurricanes. But uh, if we move out into phase uh, two and three on the MJO, and Kyle McRitchie is correct, it's going to get pretty darn busy in the Atlantic Basin. I'm meteorologist DET. I'll talk to you soon.